so yeah, so thank you for joining us um, today um, uh, for this special Christmas event, which is co-hosted uh, by CBA Christians uh, with, in partnership with the City Bible Forum. And before we start, uh, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional um, custodians of this land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So for people that don't know who I am, I'm Pedro Leal, and uh, I'm a member of the CBA Christians group here uh, that meet at CBA, and I work in financial services, and I'm primarily based here in the Darwin Park Tower One. And CBA Christians is a group that's been running for a while some time, and it's a group of non-denominational um, Christians with a common faith in Jesus Christ. And we uh, have fellowship and meet in the name of Jesus. We gather regularly across all the various um, campuses, be it DP1, CBS, CBP North, um, South, even out at Sydney Olympic Park, and also Parramatta. Well, what do we do? So we gather together to pray, support one another. We read God's Word, which is the Bible. We catch up over lunch um, for a bit of social time. And also we um, engage and support one another on, on Yammer. So do find us on Yammer um, if you're on there. So today we're delighted to have um, Dr. Sam Chan with us. Uh, you want to invite Sam to come up? So... So here, who has seen or heard Sam before? Got um, a massive following. I feel very, very sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Sam, you may have heard a lot about him already. So, from what I know, uh, Sam's married to Steph, mm -hmm. has three children. Right? He's a public speaker. Uh, works for the City Bible Forum, is also a medical doctor, as many of you would know. And um, I'm still yet to get an invite for karaoke because you oh, mentioned that you're man. a karaoke Karaoke party. is so much fun. I do date night with my wife once a week, and this time last year we did the craziest date night. It was open mic karaoke at the Old Manly Boat Shed, <laughs> where there's a live band, a drummer, a guitarist, and another, and a bass. And you get up there and you just Google the words and they will sing the song in front of 200 drunken Aussies. It's the old manly boat shed. Uh, people go there when they've been locked out of every other venue on the northern <laughs> beach. And some of this explains your fourth or fifth choice when everywhere else is closed. And it was the most high adrenaline thing. I got up there and I said, Where I'm going to sing you the unofficial Chinese national anthem. And I sang them K San by Cold Chisel. <laughs> and I still remember in front of me was this Caucasian Aussie. He was so drunk, he was barely vertical, like just trying to state which way is up, which way is up. And at the end, I gave him a big kiss on the forehead and I said, I love you, man. And I dropped the mic and I walked off. So that was karaoke this time last year. Old Manly Boat Shed, date night with my wife. Well, date night with me, I'm waiting for your invites. <laughs> so you all know a lot of facts about Sam. I'd like to ask you, what are three surprising facts about you that people here that know about you don't know? All right, so shock, I, shocking, these really are just coming randomly. Shocking fact number one, I'm a doctor, but I only just scraped through with a pass. So I got like, I, I don't know what, I used to study really, really hard in high school and you get good marks. Somehow you go to university, you study really, really hard and you just got really awful marks. So I never quite crack the code of university, but I used to just cruise through a 51 or 52%. And I look back now and realise they must have just passed me because they didn't want to have to, they either didn't want to come back in the holidays and give me a supplementary <laughs> exam. Because when I was in education, I taught at a Bible college, and I remember people would fail with 45%. And the head of the department would call me into the office and go, hey, 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 this guy got 45%. Do you think you could go through the essay questions again? And I'll go through my essay questions. And do you think we could just find one or two extra marks and then we can give him a 50? Otherwise, you and I are back in the Christmas holidays supervising a supplementary exam. So I scraped through medicine with a pass. Uh, shocking. But you know, they say, hey, what do you call a doctor who got 51%? You call him doctor. So that's all you need. You only need 51% to be a doctor. Uh, shocking fact number two, I used to play a lot of rugby. I played to up until the age of maybe 40. Uh, rugby was compulsory in my high school, so that's how far back I'm going. They could not make rugby compulsory these days. 
Uh, it was mandatory to play rugby. Somehow every Asian managed to get a note from their doctor saying they were too sick or frail to play rugby. <laughs> but I wanted to play rugby, so I played rugby and I played in university. I even played when I was in Chicago. And shocking fact number three is I used to get knocked out all the time. Like, like concussions are a real thing. So people used to run at me and I'd get ready to make a tackle and I would tell myself, this is going to be the last thing you remember for the next two hours and then you're just going and make the tackle. And my wife would have to drive me to the games because after the game I could not remember where I parked my car. And if you've ever been concussed, this is what it feels like. You know that feeling you get when you wake up in the morning and you think, is it a weekday, is it a weekend, is it a weekday, is it a weekend, can I sleep in to get up? And you slowly come into consciousness and work out where you are. Well that happens to me, I think, oh. I'm in a rugby field, I'm in the middle of a rugby game, and I have no memory for the last two hours. And what happens is you ask the same question over and over again, because you can't remember you've asked the question. And it's always, did we win, what was the score? Did we win, what was the score? Did we win, what was the score? And people are just saying, shut him up. Someone just shut him up. But at least I was asking, did we win, what was the score? Did we win, what was the score? Someone else I know kept asking, did I look good? Did I look good? Did I look good? Did I look good? So you've got to be worried. If you get concussed, you start asking uh, and talking about the secrets deepest and most meaningful to you. So you've got to make sure your heart is pure before you play a game of rugby. You will reveal too much about yourself. All right, that's how I've ever been concussed, but I'll take that. That's good advice. So, you work for City Bubble Forum. Can you tell us a little bit about what you guys do, where you guys are? Oh gosh, City Bible Forum. Uh, we are everywhere and we get nowhere. How are we going to That's the best way of answering that. Well, I say, you know, if you were once a, a university student, there were all these campus groups. There was the Origami Society, there was the Rugby Society, and there were these Christian groups. And then what are these Christian groups doing? Uh, but what they do is they exist to help network other Christians with other Christians and also to help. Um, you know, for people searching, asking the bigger, deeper questions of meaning, purpose, hope, uh, we exist there to answer those questions for you. So now I'm thinking, okay, we're not at university anymore, we're working in a business district. City Bible Forum exists for that way, for Christians to network with other Christians, to pray, support, encourage each other, and also to provide those safe spaces for sacred conversations about the bigger questions of meaning, purpose, and hope. And that's exactly what's happening right now. Awesome. Well, we're really excited to hear from you. Um, guys, you've got questions, uh, put your hand up at the end, or SMS, and uh, we'll ask the question at the end. But uh, we'll hand over to Sam now. All right, thank you. Thanks, Pedro. Well, these days, we all do a lot of flying. But think about it, we are in a plane that is 500,000 kilograms of metal. How does it stay in the air without just boom, plummeting to the ground like a rock? And yet, when they give us the air safety announcement, none of us are listening. And when they tell us to look around for the nearest exits, none of us turn around. And when they tell us to put our plane, planes on, our phones on flight mode, I'm sure most of us here are not putting our phones on flight mode. Because we're thinking, oh, it's the air safety announcement, I've heard it all before, what are they going to tell me that I don't know, why do I need to listen, what's it got for me? But, just this year, Southwest Airlines flying from Dallas to New York, they had the plane crash, the emergency landing. One of the engines blew up, a bit of shrapnel, went through the window, killed one passenger, depressurized the cabin, and sure enough, it happened, <coughs> the oxygen mask did drop down, and this photo shows that every single passenger put it on the wrong way. <laughs> it's meant to go over your nose and not your mouth. The air safety announcement, what are they gonna tell us that we need to know? Well, it seems like none of us are paying attention when we should be paying attention. And Christmas feels the same way, doesn't it? Ah, oh, it's Christmas again, blah, 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 blah. I've heard it all before. Baby Jesus, born in a manger, there were donkeys, camels, goats and cows. What do I need to know about Christmas? I've heard it all before. Well, that's the point of today's talk. We're gonna do, and it's been titled, Three Shocking Facts About Christmas. Uh, they do not want you to know, and yes, it's shameless clickbait, but the third one will shock you the most. And so this will come in the form of a 20-minute talk from me now, and afterwards you can ask me any questions that you want. 
via SMS or you can put up your hands. So think of what questions you might want to ask and let's look at the three shocking facts about Christmas. So let's go, shocking fact number one. We actually have, because of Christmas, because of Christmas, we have way more dignity than we dared imagine. Now, this is the poo emoji, and it is in the top 10 most used emojis. It is the second most used standalone emoji. It's an official part of the emoji lexicon. It's coded, it's got its own code. What is the popularity of the poo emoji, or the poop emoji, if you're from the USA? I think it's the dissonance between the fact that it's a pile of poo, which is disgusting, and yet it's got a cute face, which is oh so cute. It's the dissonance, the subversive nature of this emoji that makes it so appealing. Because there's something disturbing and disgusting about poo. If you ever travel to Japan, you know they have these very high-tech toilet seats where they have these controls, and there's a button you can push to play music. Why? So it covers up the sound of you doing a poo. There's something very disgusting and disturbing about poo. I work one day a week as a doctor, and doctors and nurses, we can stomach anything, brains, blood, bile, butt. If there's poo, we all go, and we run away and we do not touch it and we leave to the most junior member of the team, me, to have to clean up because there's something very degrading about poo. And yet at Christmas, Jesus came to us as a baby, a helpless baby, covered in poo. And I was Jesus saying there is dignity even in being helpless, even in poo, no matter where we find ourselves, there is dignity no matter what stage or state of life we find ourselves in. So when my boys were younger and I had to change their pooey nappy, I used to joke with them. I used to say, now just remember, one day you'd be doing this for me. And it's sort of funny, but sort of not funny at the same time, because studies show that one in two of us in this room will end life the way we began it, in nappies and poo with Alzheimer's disease. And the other one in two of us are going to end life having to care for that other one in two person, a person with Alzheimer's in nappies and poo. And having played rugby all my life, and having had all my concussions, I think I know which in the one and two I will be in a marriage. So I'm taking one for the team there. I'm going to be that guy. Uh, but at the same time, Jesus comes to us helpless as a baby, not talking, not walking, in nappies and poo. And my grandmother ended her life not talking, my grandfather ended his life not walking, and I'm going to end my life in nappies, needing someone else to wipe my bottom. And Christmas actually says, you know what? That's okay. Because the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, at the top of the pecking order, became one of us, not just one of us, but a baby, not just a baby, but a helpless baby. So that means there is dignity, more dignity than we dare imagine as a human no matter what stage or state of life we find ourselves in. That's shocking fact number one. Shocking fact number two is this. Because of Christmas, there really is such a thing as evil. Evil is a thing. Now, as you heard earlier, I'm married to Stephanie. I have three young boys, Toby, Cooper and Jonty, age 11, 9 and 7. Toby we named after dog names because Sam has always been a top 10 dog name so we went through dog names and the top dog name is actually Jack but we couldn't call him Jackie Chan because that would be <laughs> he'll get a hard time for that Cooper we went through B names Killian Kilkenny Cooper and Jonty we went through jock names so they're Jonty Rhodes the cricket player so they're high energy they're high fun and there was one night it was my job to put them to bed so I read them a bedtime story around 7 o'clock, put them to bed. But then they came to my bed at 10 o'clock at night saying, Dad, we can't sleep. Can you please read us another bedtime story? And I said, I can do better than that. I pulled out my laptop computer. They joined me in my bed and I said, let me now show you something you've never seen before. And I showed them on YouTube. Pro wrestling. I said, you have never seen this before. This is WWE pro wrestling. They're coming off the ropes. They're good guys. John Cena. They're bad guys. The Undertaker. And 
one, we're watching this game, it was a triple tag team match, and we're in it, and suddenly, while we're watching this game on YouTube, in my bed, the bed starts shaking, like there's an earthquake. And we can hear this racking noise, da 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 And my oldest son, Toby, says, Dad, what's happening? What is that noise? And I said, I think it's a younger brother, Jonty. And we turn around, and he was just flooded with adrenaline. He was quaking so hard, his teeth were chattering, and he was shaking the bed against the wall. He was so pumped and amped. He had never seen anything like this. But afterwards, I had to break it to them. Oh, boys, I hate to tell you this, but none of, the, none of this is real. It's all make-believe. There are no good guys and there are no bad guys. It's just a construct. It's make-believe. It just is good entertainment. And for a long time, we've told ourselves that as well, haven't we? There's no such thing as good guys or bad guys. Evil is a religious, social, political construct. In the end, we're all just good people. We might make some bad choices every now and then, but we're just good people. And we tell ourselves that story so we can all get along. So we don't look for bad guys and we don't have this us versus them narrative. And so in the original Christmas story, when they say King Herod heard about baby Jesus being born and he was so threatened by another king, Jesus out there, he went and ordered the death of all the babies under the age of two, I just think, oh, that didn't happen. That's just make-believe. No one could be that evil. But just this year, I went to Israel and I went on a tour and the Israel tour guide said Herod really was a bad guy. He was a megalomaniac. He was a psychopathic killer. So this is Herodian. It's basically a man-made mountain that Herod built for himself. It was a palace, a fortress for himself. In the end, he got buried. When he died, he got buried on this site. But more than that, when he died, he ordered the death of his adult sons. He wanted his own children killed because he was threatened by them becoming a king. And so suddenly he realized Herod really was a bad guy. Evil is a thing. And I lived in America when September 9-11 happened. And suddenly we're thinking, whoa, this is evil. And I remember Time magazine uh, on the back page, on the essay section, Lance Morrow wrote the same thing. We've got to call this for what it is. Evil. It's evil. And maybe we've sort, thought the same thing with the Bali bombings, the synagogue shooting just a month or two ago. Evil is a thing. But here's the problem. Then. If evil is real, then we might have to return. What's to stop us from going back to the good guys, bad guys, us, versus them, tribalism, where we all end up in factions at war with each other again. What's to stop this from happening? Well, this brings us to shocking fact number three. And shocking fact number three is this. The line between good and evil begins in our own very hearts. So many years ago when I was a doctor, I did a very short mission trip uh, in East Africa. And in East Africa, they have a problem with mosquitoes and malaria. So to go to bed at night, you need to put this mosquito netting around you. And as you crawl into the netting, all these mosquitoes are on the outside trying to get in. And you just got to tell yourself to get a good night's sleep. They're on the outside. Uh, just trust your netting. It'll be okay. And then you can get a good night's sleep. But one night when I went to bed, outside the netting, right at face level, was <laughs> a hairy African spider just hovering above my face. And I thought, it's okay, he's on the outside, just trust your netting, he's more afraid of you than you are of him, and get a good night's sleep. So I did. But the next night, when I crawled into bed, there he was again, just above my face. And I said the same thing, it's okay, he's on the outside, trust your netting, he's more afraid of you than you are of him, get a good night's sleep, and I did. But the next night, when I went to bed, there he was again, just outside my face. It's all right, he's on the outside, trust your netting. He's more afraid of you, and I got another good night's sleep. Well, the next day, my roommate comes to me and says, Sam, 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 what are you going to do about that spider? I said, it's all right, he's on the outside. My friend goes, no, 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 he's on the inside of your netting. That's why he's been there every single night, and I check, I... There he was, ba 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 ba. He was on the inside. What I thought was on the outside was on the inside. 
And that's the whole premise of this scary movie, isn't it? When a stranger calls, the phone rings, and you think the killer is outside the home, and it's only the reveal. Ba -ba 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 -ba! The killer's inside the house, and that's more scary. So the scary thing then is, evil might not just be outside us, but might also be inside us. This is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. This year is the 100th anniversary of his birthday, so he's become quite a thing again. And as you know, he was a Russian patriot. He fought for the Russian army in World War II, but he said one or two things against Stalin, and because of that, they locked him up in a gulag, a very harsh gulag, Siberia, where people froze to death, starved to death, and were beaten to death. And he spent many years as a prisoner in his gulag, and he started to hate his captors, the guards, seeing them as evil people. But suddenly Alexander Solzhenitsyn had this pfft, Copernican moment and realised, I am no different from the prison guards. If the circumstances were just changed a little bit, I would be them and they would be me. And so he writes the most famous, or oh, very famous line that we're all starting to rediscover and quote again, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Evil isn't out there, it actually begins inside all of us. And Jesus would agree, because if you read more about Jesus in the Bible, he has this very famous talk, the Sermon on the Mount, where he says things like, why do you look for the speck of dirt in your brother's eye and you don't notice the, the log, the plank inside your own eye? And then I would say, Jesus, oh, but Jesus, I'm not as bad as you think I am. I've never stolen anything. But Jesus says, oh, but in your heart you envy. And then I would say to Jesus, oh, but I haven't killed anyone. And Jesus would say, oh, but in your heart you've got grudges. And I would say, but I've never cheated on my wife. But Jesus said, oh, but in your heart you've looked at other women, haven't you? In other words, evil isn't just out there, it's in here. The line dividing good and evil cuts through every human heart. And we're all rediscovering this now. So this is Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he's a liberal, secular, atheist, Jew, Jewish psychologist lecturing in America. And this is his bestseller. It's just come out this year, The Coddling of the American Mind. And he argues the same thing. Part of what's led to this culture of safetyism, helicopter parenting, microaggressions, safe spaces, is we're all looking for witch hunts, as if the evil is out there. When Jonathan High says, no, no, we need to start looking inside ourselves first. David Brooks, columnist for the New York Times, just October this year, the new Cold War, says we're in a new Cold War. We're so partisan now. Left versus right, red versus blue, liberal versus progressives. Oh, we're so tribal. He says the only way to come together again and find unity is to realise, you know what? We're all, we all have evil inside all of us, and that is what will unify us. But then if we've all got evil inside all our hearts, what's the way forward? And that's the message of Jesus and Christmas. Matthew chapter 1, when Jesus is born, the parents are told this, you are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. And you know, that's the shocking fact about Christmas. Jesus didn't come just to be a good teacher. He didn't come just to be a drinking buddy. He was all of that, but more. But he actually came to save us from ourselves. We fall short, there's guilt, there's shame, and he comes to save us and to make us the people that we need to be and God wants us to be. So three shocking facts about Christmas. Jesus came to us as a baby. There's way more dignity than we dared imagine. But evil is also real. And there's more evil than we dare admit. And the problem begins with us, not out there, but inside us. But then Jesus gives us more hope than we could dream of because he will save us from our sins. Now, you heard earlier, I work one day a week as a doctor. And I work as a surgical assistant. And you think, what is a surgical assistant? My job is to hold the leg while the surgeon operates on it. Uh, a trained blind monkey can do what I do, and the only reason why I turn up to work is so that they don't find out how well the day went without an assistant. Whoa, that went well without an assistant. Why do we need an assistant? And I've told some of you earlier, the dynamic goes like this, the nurses look at the surgeon operating thing. 
I can see how that takes six years of med school. Then they're looking underneath that is keeping your eye. I can see how that takes six years of med school. And they just see me holding the leg. And they think, how on earth does that take six years of med school? A trained blind monkey can do a better job than that guy. That is me, the surgical assistant. But early this year, I went to my own surgeon to get my knee operated on for an elective arthroscopy. And for professional courtesy, because I was a doctor, they let me go first. I'm first on the list. So I don't have to fast for as long. I'm done, I can be home before lunchtime. So I'm lying in the bed there, waiting to be operated on. The surgeon's there, the anaesthetist is there, all the nurses are lined up, and then someone says, where's the surgical assistant? And everyone laughs, ha, 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 he's the one lying in the bed. But my surgeon goes, no, 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 I organise cover, I organise a replacement. Half an hour later, the assistant doesn't turn up. He's forgotten. So the surgeon looks at me and says, you know what you're going to have to do? Okay, so I had to get out of bed, get out of my patient gear, put on the doctor's scrubs, and I had to work for the whole list, assisting every case, new by mouth, fasting, and at the end of the list now, I got out of the doctor gear, put the patient gear, jumped into bed, and they kept me awake and just put in all these drugs and see what they would do to me, and they were filming me, very <laughs> professional. And, and I had my operation, and it was all fun and games, but a few weeks later, I got a knee infection, so I had to go back to hospital. And at first, I thought, nah, 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 it doesn't, it's not too bad. And I didn't cancel any work, I didn't cancel any speaking engagements, but one day led to another day, led to another day, led to another day. In the end, I needed two more operations. I was in hospital for 16 days. Um, when I came out, I lost five kilograms of weight. My leg looked like a toothpick. It was stuck out straight, I couldn't bend it. And I thought, that was amazing. Like, people asked me what it was like. I, I said, looking back now, I felt like I was falling down a hole, but I didn't know where bottom was. I didn't know when I would hit the bottom. And then when you hit the bottom, I didn't know when I was going to be able to climb back out. And so they say you actually won't get bat better until you realise you're in a hole. And I think for a long time I was denying, I think, nah, nah, this will be all right, don't have to cancel any work, it's just a flesh wound. But bit by bit, I was no, this really is serious. I could lose a leg here. So you're down, it's only like, now this is bad, you've got to know you've fallen down a hole in order to get out of the hole. And that's sort of the message of Christmas. We have to know that we have fallen down a hole. There is a line between good and evil that cuts through our own hearts. We have secrets, we have shame, we fall short of the people we need to be. But Christmas comes to say that, you know what? We have far more dignity than we dared imagine, but we're far worse than we dared admit. But there's far more hope than we could dream of. Because Jesus came to be one of us, more than just a good teacher, more than a drinking buddy, but he came to save people from their sins. Thanks.